Thanks to AwesomeX.com for sponsoring The Bridge with Kira. Supercharge your immunity with LB17 and the other fine products at AwesomeX.com. O-S-U-M-E-X.com. everyone. Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Kira Young, and you've reached me on Revolution Radio, simulcasting on Real Liberty Media. Thank you, everyone, for joining me tonight. I have a great guest. If you like the show and you like the station, you're welcome to support us. This is a listener-supported station, so keep that in mind. Everyone's welcome, and everyone has something to offer. Let me see if my friend is available to talk to me. Looks like he is. Hey, Alan, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I am. Welcome to the bridge. Thanks for coming back. Absolutely. I am so happy to speak to you again. So, I know we have some new listeners tonight who've never heard of Sync Book Press and they've never heard of Alan Abadessa Green, so... For those listeners, give us a little recap of who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, so uh, I was born and raised in New York. Um, 9-11 happened. It sort of, you know, messed with my mind as as I guess is, would be normal. <laughs> um, and I... S- soon found myself sort of going down the rabbit holes of conspiracy, uh, what happened there, um, but it was more of a practical, pragmatic, who done it type investigation. But as you, as I'm sure many people know, you start going down those rabbit holes and start trying to figure out what's really going on in the world, and your, your world view starts to crumble. Um, I, I often equate it with a sort of psychedelic ego death, uh, just as literally as everything you know starts to have a giant question mark on it. And that, uh, I think that's ultimately a healthy process, but it also can be a pretty rough one. Um, but I would say after a few years of being really heavy into the sort of left-brained, uh, pragmatic approach to it, weird coincidences uh, I started to notice a, a number of synchronicities. Uh, we're going to use that word a lot tonight. Synchronicity essentially just can be summarized as a meaningful coincidence. And I started to notice a, a number of synchronicities around 9-11 uh, and other um, sort of major nodes in the conspiracy vein. And there were a lot of things where, again, that question mark, that big question mark started to... I needed to place that in even my newfound worldview because things that people were projecting as this was controlled by some massive cabal 
uh, were controlling all aspects of these events, but I noticed things that really to me seemed like they couldn't, or I'd have a really hard time imagining that they were planned by human hands, that these were intentional um, connections or motions on the world stage. So that's when I discovered a group of bloggers. Um, it was mostly at that point it was blogs and some YouTube videos of a group of people who call themselves synchro mystics and they were basically looking at all of these strange connections and trying to figure out just just playing with how everything kind of interconnected and that quickly uh, sort of pulled me in I just I these were people who I saw were on the sort of cutting edge something that I knew was incredibly meaningful and was having a really hard time putting my finger on, these guys sort of helped my path uh, to, to look further at those coincidences and uh, sort of start to develop, I don't want to say uh, develop a world view, but um, start to take that side of it a lot more seriously. And I would actually stress the fact that I don't know that there is a world view coming out of synchro mysticism, uh, and a lot of people don't even affiliate with that term, but um, I believe it was 2011, I did the first sync book, which was a an anthology. Uh, 26 different essays, I asked all these different bloggers and filmmakers and people who I knew who were working with this to each write me an essay on what they thought all these synchronicities meant or, or how they were invested. And the point of that, really for me, was to show that there are many different ways to look at this, that there wasn't a sort of united front, that there wasn't a, a singular worldview to come out of this, that was, this was not a dogmatic thing, this was a, a searching thing, this was a sort of kaleidoscope lens with which to, to investigate anything, and you can take a little of the, you take that pragmatic whodunit approach, but you also take the extreme mystical approach, you also take thousands of middle ground gray area points of view and you sort of factor them in and learn to, to look at all these events or any piece of information uh, through this. It's sort of like, you know, uh, what's his name? Jan Urban Scott is Trivium. This is sort of like the Trivium on acid or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that the, the show that was on before this one, the last thing they started talking about was um, synchronicity before they went off air and I don't think they had any idea what we were going to talk about next so that's kind of interesting in and of itself there um, but I, it also occurred to me when you were summing everything up that it's like you, when you start looking at it you start looking at the at at this sort of matrix of seemingly opposing multiple realities um, that's where I guess the on acid part comes in. <laughs> but right, that's... <laughs> and I don't mean that literally. <laughs> right, right. Maybe for some. But... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's one thing that um, natives are really good at is um, just sitting with those those multiple realities that are seemingly opposing. Um, that's one thing that uh, one muscle that you can develop um, hanging around Indians. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because, um, you know, particularly as you and I have discussed previously, um, the distinction between, say, respecting various cultures versus a sort of, even in a quote-unquote positive way, stereotyping or turning other, other cultures into tropes. Um, uh, I, have a, I have a friend, a black guy, who he he points out this idea of what he calls the mystical negro that in fiction you always have or and not so much anymore but there, there used to be it's always white main characters and then they stumble across some person who's going to show them the mystical path and it's either it could be a native american person it could be um some old black creole woman you know the oracle from the matrix or uh, a voodoo lady and what, what was that a uh, garden of good and evil or you know something like that or, or it's going to be some old Chinese kung fu master you know basically that he saw this as an insulting 
uh, trope for for the you know non-white sort of hey you're included but as you're still being othered and I've um, sort of struggled with that sometimes because in a way it's almost how do you say like I can see in one respect that it's almost in a really bizarre and adolescent way paying respect to these cultures as if they hold some sort of knowledge that modern western white culture doesn't have um, and at the same time I can also see how it could be uh, insulting to be sort of reduced down to that so it's just anyway it's something I struggle with that that sort of dichotomy there and uh, but as you say it's holding multiple realities in your head and I can sort of understand these different takes these different viewpoints it's not um it's not an Orwellian two plus two equals four. It's just sort of learning to be a little bit comfortable with paradox. Yeah, right. Which is, it, it's not allowed in the overarching culture. It's, uh, um, you're either one thing or you're the other. You're forced into these different camps by, um, you know, and, and, and some of that's engineered and some of that's just the way, the, the way that our brains sort of fall back on things. Um, just through training um, but yeah it's not allowed and uh, so that's maybe why um, the the sync community sort of exists on the margins in, in, in some ways oh yeah I don't expect to have any you know at least in, in the short term I don't expect to have any major breakthrough um, and we actually had uh, this October something really interesting happened we had uh, so oh yeah, you said we have new new listeners, so let's sort of explain real quick what a sync video is. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do it, but basically it would be a, a video uh, different from your standard. People have probably seen a million videos on YouTube. It's usually like an expose, right? You know, we're going to show you how the Bilderberg Group took down World Trade Center Seven, or you know, something like like that. Um, where you're, you're, you're pointing out a culprit. Uh, or you might have these other more vlog-type points where you'd have uh, some alternative media figure telling you, this is what I think of this situation, or let me in on, you know, let me show you what this is. A sync video, and again, even there are multiple styles to them, are, again, more ex exploratory and uh, I would actually argue a lot more artistic uh, some of them are really just there for artistic value with no direct statement attached to them uh, just sort of laying out some of these connections for someone to figure out um, so someone uh, a, f a friend of mine Joe Alexander um, he actually made a video it's called back to the future predicts 9-11 I wouldn't be surprised if some of your listeners saw this video. We actually premiered it last year. We held a, a Sync Summit in Olympia, and Joe premiered his early version of that film uh, in Olympia at our at our film festival. Well, October twenty first is it? Uh, two thousand fifteen is the day in Back to the Future two that uh, Marty and Doc Brown are supposed to go to the future and it turned into this weird viral moment on the internet where people celebrated it as a back to the future day. Well, it just so happens that Joe had sort of finished his final draft of that video, put it on YouTube. It was already getting a lot of attraction um, just because he, I honestly, because he made it so skillfully. And, uh... And I, and I guess because he made, he also, part of that skill was making it controversial enough, putting enough of a, something in your face to, to, to make it a conversation piece more than just a sort of abstract art. But uh, Back to the Future Day happens, and suddenly Joe's sync video is getting shared everywhere. It's getting shared on Huffington Post and uh, Comedy Central did a, a whole thing about it on one of their shows on, on mainstream TV. Um, oh God, I don't know. Washington Post did an article about us. Uh, you know, The Onion and AV Club, like all these sort of 
fairly major news outlets are suddenly making articles about this video and saying, what is this guy saying? What, what is this? Um, and we had this weird flash in the pan moment where some people were questioning, was this going to be the point at which we're not on the margins anymore? But uh, a sort of hilarious thing happened. I mean, I, I had no real expectations from it. But it's actually really, to me, in a weird sort of way, funny to see how people weren't, either weren't ready for it or, huh. we got a ton, on my website, thesyncbook.com, got a ton of traffic from the Washington Post. I mean, that's a pretty major news outlet. And they did a really, I have to say, a fairly uh, nice article on us. It was fairly well presented. So we got a ton of traffic from there. But what's funny is, I would say like a fraction of a person, I actually did the math, of how many people visited the site versus how many people even clicked on a podcast, watched a video, anything. <laughs> okay, so that means thousands of people suddenly flood my website and they're like, what is this weird stuff? And moved on with their lives. Um, and the sort of cynic in me, or the pragmatic part of me that still remains, is saying, well, of course they're not ready for this. I mean, e there's, a, there's a process that I think all of us go through, and I would assume is a constant evolution, not only of our worldviews, but just of learning how to digest information that may be uncomfortable or foreign to us. Um, it's why, for me, the conspiracy, that really hardcore conspiracy phase I went through was really valuable for me because it helped me, again, break down some worldviews and just learn to be open, but also taught me a ton of discernment of how do you, how do you, do you are you just taking this guy's word for it, that this is what happened? Um, what's the difference between listening to Alex Jones and taking his word for it versus listening to Walter Cronkite and taking his word for it? So, developing discernment, but also uh, 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 being comfortable with stepping into unfamiliar territory. Um, so anyway, I guess I've I told two. I've learned two things from this. One is that a mainstream breakout of marginal information is probably not going to flourish. You could take a fish out of the ocean and throw it on the sand, it's going to flounder and basically die. It's not, it's, it's not designed for that environment, or that environment isn't prepared to host this new life form or thought form. But I also, there's a small part of me that holds out a small amount of, I don't know if hope is the word, but uh, I know my experience Again, I, even though I had already sort of gone, started, at least started down this path, I realized that I had seen a few sync videos about nine months before I really got into this study. And when I first saw them, I was like, okay, that was weird, that was interesting, I don't really know what to make of that, and moved on with my life. And it was about... About nine months later, which is interesting as a human gestation period, but it was about nine months later that I somehow stumbled upon, I think it might have been the same video or a, or a video made by the same person, and I was like, suddenly something clicked in my brain that I had developed enough, that I had been exposed to enough, that suddenly that made sense to me. And I said, oh, now I get what they're doing. And it was just like a light bulb went off in my head. Now I get what they're doing. Like, where it's what seemed like gibberish nine months ago, now makes total sense. So there's a part of me that wonders if, okay, you get, I mean, Joe's video of, I mean, we're talking, it's in the millions now. Um, millions of people saw this video. What happens nine months from now? I don't expect millions of people to suddenly be interested in synchronicity, but, you know, I think uh, you plant a seed and you see what sort of happens. Um, there's, there's a small part, again, I, it's not like I have a, an expectation or a hope of some specific outcome, but I, 
even though the cynic in me is like, well, of course the wa the readers of the Washington Post are not going to be interested in our bizarre <laughs> explorations of the universe. At the same time, I I think there's uh, probably a, some really interesting outcome that I'm never going to really be able to witness, or there's no tangible outcome of that. Um, and yet I feel like that, that undoubtedly had an effect on the, on the psyche of, of many people. Absolutely, and, and in a way it was kind of like being in an alternate universe for a day, you know, where, where sync is all the rage, and then we go back to the regular world that we actually live in, where, <laughs> <laughs> where it's like, who, what, what are you talking about, sync? I don't know. Um... But yeah, that's, that was a really weird phenomenon. And as you were describing um, your process, I think I would, would say I would have had a similar process with learning about sync book and all, the sync community. And it just gradually sort of started sinking in. It's still sinking in for me, actually. <laughs> I don't understand it all, but hey, um, uh, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, very because I, I don't have the whole history, so that's that's part of it, too, is when you start watching these videos, you, you're not getting all the backstories that led to that, because it, it's a really deep um, rabbit hole, I guess you, you could say. Um, so a lot of the videos, it's like you had to watch other videos to really get as deep into it as you can, if that makes any sense. Sure, I mean... Um, that's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with your experience, so I, I'm, all I can really say is, you know, that's, that's a good, I don't know, note or observation for me to be aware of. Um, you know, and, and let's also point out here, I'm not the sort of grand architect of who's making what videos, so. Right, right. Um, again, I, I want to sort of stress here, this is an decentralized, um, non-dogmatic it's it's a group of people who are exploring a similar subject but each coming at it from their own perspective and their own history um, I have no uh, I don't, I don't I just, and I don't mean that to distance myself from that comment but to say yeah I think what you're what you're sort of witnessing is that uh, fragmented nature of it which from one perspective is probably a bad thing in that it'll keep it somewhat on the fringe if it makes it a little harder to be accessible and then there's another part of me that says uh, I wouldn't have it any other way in, in one respect because I don't I don't want to step in and say hey you know make your art work like this or <laughs> you know right. I, I don't ever want to yeah. sort of put any hierarchy in place um, that said, I mean, I, I have definitely made an effort. I I recognize the confusion or sort of um, the how massive it all seems and how it seems very insider that's almost kind of clicky of, okay, these people are speaking the same language. Uh, one of the reasons I did that sync book, probably one of the prime reasons I did it, was to make this more accessible. I said, oh, I saw what it took for me to get into it. and how much sort of study and development I had to do to kind of figure out not only what was I being presented with or what were people trying to convey, but, but what to make of it, etc. And I would say that's still a development. You say it's still sinking in. I mean, I've been at this for a long time, and I've, uh, I've been a pretty active figure in this, uh, again, I'm not trying to put any hierarchy on it, but I've, this has been a really huge part of my life for the last um, almost decade, and um, I'm still developing ideas about it, I'm still trying to make sense of it all. The only thing I can say for sure is that there's a phenomenon or phenomena at play that are completely undeniable. I, that's, that's the only thing I can really say for certain is that I know their synchronicity is something incredibly real and I also know that in the last decade I've heard about a thousand different interpretations of what that means I've myself have had a thousand different thoughts of what it could mean um, and I kind of 
kind of like that because the day that suddenly we have this unified front and we're saying synchronicity means X or Y is the day I would be honestly kind of scared that it was becoming a, a religious or pseudo-political movement or something. Right. It's kind of like each expression um, of the sync, it, it, it's like a wave and you either catch it or you don't. But you keep swimming out there anyway because you know it's going to be really cool when you do. <laughs> when you do catch that <laughs> wave. You know? Um, oh, yeah. 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 That's that's about as, as good as I could could put it. And uh, what's interesting is that when I saw all this stuff happening with um, the Back to the Future Day, I knew it was it was um, that it would not last. Like there's almost a um, co-op co-optation proof uh, element to this because it's so non-centralized and non-dogmatic, as you say, that it's it's co-opted proof and everything good is co-opted so um i Man, guess i hope i hope you're right but by the way that's that's my that's my hope for sure that you build something that no one can really take over or turn away because it's designed right if there's no if there's no leadership and no sort of central direction how do you control such a thing right and you you can't <laughs> you can't, which is, and it's funny because that's, I mean, that may be your wish now, but I'm sure, like you said, you're not even <laughs> the grand architect, right? So, um, nobody is, and that's, that's it. Nobody's the grand architect, or the sink is the grand architect, you know, it's... <laughs> totally. I mean, I think yeah. what's happened is throughout the years, there's been a few people... Uh, who have been sort of, you know, like any alternative movement, you have sort of people rise to to the status of some sort of authority, and um, maybe to my own disadvantage, uh, when when there came the point after I did the sync book, there came a moment where that was me, where I was sort of the there was a, a potentiality to be some guru figure in alternative media and that was I ran from that as about as hard as I could sure um, <laughs> uh, and but but there have been others before me that you know have similar have had similar things where they um, I think everyone sort of tried to turn down that role uh, I think I think it's a really good a good cr crew a good crowd of people um you know, there have been, undoubtedly, there have been a number of jerks uh, within our midst, but uh, I don't, I ne never really got the impression that it was someone trying to come in and co-opt it, it's just some, you know, jerk who develops his own following, and they and pretty much it stay, it, it, it splinters off into its own thing, and uh, I think people get frustrated by the fact that they're not able to sway the larger community and they kind of branch off into their own little corner of hate or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the best example of of the sync community being uncooptable, I guess, um, would be the whole red ice phenomena where, um, you know, they turned into a, a bunch of Nazis and you guys said, well, hell with this, you know, instead of saying, oh, I guess we're Nazis now. I mean, which is essentially how the co-opting happens, and I'm sure there was probably some grand architect going on there um, in that um, whole situation where, because it's come up again with this whole, you know, white genocide crap, and um, the sync people are, are definitely rejecting it completely. They're not buying it, they're not into it. And again, like you said, it just sort of splinters off into its own kind of thing. Yeah, we had, um, so, I guess, I mean, this is maybe, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if you guys have any 
chat group or, or anything on this call or if uh, if we've got sort of go too far too fast just let me know but yeah if you want to jump in there I mean uh, I'll give you some of the history is maybe let's start there so there was uh, one of the main blogs was this blog called the sinkhole with a W all right and um, so we had this one figure Jake Katza who made these basically the way Joe Alexander had his success with his Back to the Future videos, Jake had a similar amount of success, I mean, relatively, um, with some of his early videos. But that was they were more conspir- conspiratorially targeted. He was, again, still trying to figure out what it all meant. So he's saying, hey, I'm studying this conspiracy, and I noticed these symbols. I mean, you see a ton of it now of people saying, look at these symbols, they mean Freemasonry, they mean the Illuminati, etc., right? Well, if he's just sort of pointing out, hey, I noticed this symbol repeats, but not just this symbol, but this symbolism repeats. And it could have very easily turned into the sort of quasi-Christian um, uh, America first sort of we got to stop the Illuminati and the Freemasons, sort of thing. I think there was there's a, there's a there was a taste of that at the beginning, for sure, of trying to figure out. Well, I see all these symbols. I mean, Freemasons and Illuminati, and this is the media that's coming out. This is the entire alternative media, sort of focused on that. And there was definitely that taste of it. Anyway, so he had this sort of crossover appeal, where he's appealing to the conspiracy people, saying, "Yeah, look at all this stuff. It's Freemasons. It's whatever." But also taking it a step further and going, but now it's getting really weird and what, what does this mean? You know, okay, so we saw all that, but what does this imply? And and I, and I don't think he had a specific answer to that. It was, again, you can watch this guy's development. That's the great thing is it's, uh, his, uh, Jay Cox's blogs are still off. He's had like three or four different blogs over the years as he's sort of gone like, eh, I don't really... I don't really jive with all the stuff I wrote for the last three years. I want to, I have this new take on it, and you can watch the guy's development. Uh, same same with his videos, um, and uh, so there's this sort of history. So so you have guys like Jay Katza, Goro Adachi, Steve Wilner. Um, I would even throw Christopher Knowles in there. We have some of these sort of figures who at, at the beginning of this movement, if we want to call it such a thing, uh, they're really active at the same time, and they're influencing each other, fighting with each other, uh, stealing from each other, learning from each other, developing this whole thing. And then as that list starts to grow and some, some more people start to be interested and contribute and make their own blogs, then you have this thing that was called the sinkhole. It was a group blog where a multiple people could write under the same blog name. So you have multiple c- contributors. Someone would start an article and someone else jumps in and finishes it. Uh, and like any great collaborative moment, it crumbles and has, there's infighting and all that sort of stuff and you have people break off. And they had little moments like that within there. Um, I don't know the exact history, but I want to say guys like, oh, what, the Celtic Rebel, do you know who that is? No, I don't. Oh, oh, you'd have, you'd have a field day with him. But um, <laughs> uh, how about do you know who Kyle Hunt is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's he's a big Nazi now, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So these guys were, for lack of a better term, sort of, you know, on the ground in the development of of all of this. Um, Certainly, uh, I don't like. I don't think they were contributors to this blog, but they were commenting. Uh, Kyle Hunt and uh, the Celtic Rebel. They started like a spoof of it. They called Stinkro Mysticism. Basically, their whole thing was all these symbols, all these everything is pointing out uh, pedophilia, and you know, ultimately they developed into this Jewish conspiracy of little boys' anuses and. I don't know how much of that was a parody and how much of that was their paranoia, but they definitely branch up into their own thing. But 
you could see with the sinkhole there came a point where they're like at first they're completely open and hey everyone contribute to this blog and then they realize oh we have some racists in our midst we have some people who you know so sort of if you have that division happen pretty early on in the thing which was that hey I'm not comfortable with these guys um, and you see this sort of schism start to happen pretty early on uh, a few years later, I found myself in a similar situation with the Sync book, where I came to this. I wasn't a member of the Sync Hole, by the way, um, and uh, I came to this with a similar sort of approach of I really want this to be open to get as many different perspectives as possible. All of the writers that I enjoy and some of the writers that I disagree with, I really want to get as big of a cross section of ideas as possible. So I start developing the book and like had, I don't know, maybe like 15 different contributing writers and then other people are like, oh, what about this guy? He also writes about Sync. And I'm like, oh, I don't know who. So someone says, what about Kyle Hunt? And I'm like, I don't know who he is. And like, oh, he writes about synchronicity. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, I go to the guy's blog and I see one or two posts which seem to be about synchronicity. And I was like, oh, cool. Here's another guy doing this. So, uh... I had no idea um, what his sort of, uh, I would say even at that time, he was, he was probably pretty unashamedly anti-Semitic, uh, at least within certain circles. Um, it, but it wasn't something that jumped out on my, on my radar, it wasn't anything. So Kyle Hunt actually has a chapter in the first Sync book. And I was I had put months of work into editing this thing and doing all the pre-press work, and we're about a day before publication, and I see Kyle Hunt. So now I'm, I, I become friends with all of them on Facebook, and I see Kyle Hunt put something up about Jews on Facebook, and I was like, "Oh my God, what is happening here? Like, did I just invite this guy into this book?" And um, wow. You know, ultimately, one of the decisions I made was, well, there's nothing about race or anything in his essay. I was completely comfortable with everything he wrote. There was nothing in there that's, that strikes me as anything wrong. Um, so the essay itself, as a sort of standalone, I was comfortable with, and I kind of, you know, I made my piece in one respect as... Let's say, um, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but let's go to the extreme analogy, it's a terrible thing to do on the internet, but Adolf Hitler, let's just go there, right, Adolf Hitler, he was a painter, let's say you saw a painting, and you're like, oh, that's a really pretty painting, and then someone said, you know, Adolf Hitler painted that. Would you have to... Now, obviously, it's going to color your viewing of that painting. But would it stop being... The, that one piece of art, would that somehow become ugly? The context is ugly. But is there no... Is that particular piece of art now stripped of its, of its value? Uh, you know its artistic value and, and I would argue the same thing sort of from an intellectual standpoint if uh, I don't know if if Hitler found the cure for cancer or something would we then go oh throw everything from that guy out <laughs> you know um, because you know, which is why I guess my point was not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and I've made a very strong stance that I, I want nothing to do with these guys I, I'm very outspoken against their points of view, uh, and yet I think there is value to what he wrote of his study of synchronicity, of showing, hey, basically his thing was a correlation between um, letters and, and colors, the, the, the alphabet and the rainbow sort of have this common uh, intrinsic sort of root system to them. Uh, which might sound like a vague thing having to do with synchronicity, but if you're basically synchronicity, you're almost sort of looking to see 
what are the archetypes? How do we take this a step back and back and back and back? What is what is the kernel idea expressed in any symbol? Because you know, the you could take a swastika and you go, well, that makes me think of Nazis. But you'd also say, but in you know, uh, Eastern Asia, that's a symbol of, of luck and fortune. It's, it's it's much older than the Nazi regime. So, how do we say what is the sort of kernel or full truth of any symbol? Um, so we can say, when I see a swastika associated with Nazism, it disgusts me. When I but the swastika itself shouldn't just across the board now be thrown in the garbage as this symbol of hatred you know why and it almost gives too much power to the nazis too much power to, to the, the hateful bastards because why do they get to come in and now claim ownership of this symbol it's the same sort of argument i've had against uh the modern day conspiracy viewpoint of oh this symbol that's a freemasonic symbol that's an illuminati symbol actually man those symbols are much older so just because a Masonic Lodge came in and decided to sort of essentially co-opt, I'm talking about co-opting something, they decided to come in and co-opt a symbol set does not mean that they own it. it does not make it a Masonic symbol. Do you, do you get what I mean? Yes, absolutely. So what I'm trying to do, and I know, understand I'm dancing a very thin line here, is I'm not an apologist for any racist or anything like that. But what I am trying to say is, even to this day, I've been asked a number of times by people, why wouldn't you go back and take Kyle Hunt, like redo the book with, with him out of it? And like, because there's va I think there's value in what he wrote there. Um, and I don't think, it, I'm, there's no danger in my mind of my book turning people into racists, <laughs> you know. Um, if anything, if people got into what we did, there's a much louder voice coming from within our community to say, screw those racists. Um, I also, it feels a bit Orwellian to me to take something someone wrote and drop it down the memory hole and pretend like it didn't happen. I'd rather have this conversation with you now and say, have to make a number of really uncomfortable decisions um, and yes to, to, to not to deny our history to say yes at some point these guys were somewhat involved in what we did and look at the direction they went in and look at the direction we went in it just makes me really uncomfortable to pretend like that didn't happen I'd much rather face it as uncomfortable as it might be mm. Yeah, and I think there's a synchronicity to it as well. There's a reason that that this happened. Um, there's there's a way that's being shown, or there's a. Uh, gosh, I can't even put it into words. There there's there's a reason that it happened, and and it was um, significant in in that it challenged you. To, to make a decision and I think either way you went you're gonna get some friction right either way <laughs> but totally, um, yeah. it's something that keeps happening again this whole Nazi thing this racism thing is something that keeps rearing its ugly head over and over and over um, so what is that you know um, I think we're going to continue to learn more about it. Um, do you get what I'm saying? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, for, for just in my experience, it happened again. And you mentioned the red eyes thing. I mean, that was for me or the sort of, as far as my measuring the sort of occurrence of this within the sync movement, that was sort of the third wave of us having to face that. Um, right. And uh, let me tell you something. So Red Ice, I'd mentioned this guy, Jake Kotza, uh, Steve Wilner, those sorts of guys. When If you look at Red Ice and you go back to their earliest episodes, so they have their full archive is up on the site. I challenge them to go back to the first year or so of Red Ice. There's, right, you can still pull them up. I mean, Jake, who's the most peaceful uh, pacifist 
I mean, not in any way affiliated with these these Nazis. He was on that show as like a regular guest every few weeks. He was like Red Ice, essentially. You know, if you want to say a conspiracy, sure you could say Red Ice put him on the map, but um. You could also argue the other way around, you know, so this was like a regular contributing guest. Um, Red Ice in its startup was very interested in the sync movement. And then at some point, the sync movement moves off into, it becomes something else, it becomes more of an artistic or, um, it, it, it sort of starts to separate from that conspiracy overlap. And Red Ice obviously went more into the conspiracy side and lost some of its mystical overlap. Um, but to say the Red Ice thing, to me, is, it's undeniably connected to the history of synchro mysticism. Because, as I said, this was something that was regularly promoted. This was, this was a major outlet if we, if we, if we had such a thing. Um, for for sync in, in its earliest days, so to see how these two sort of things have gone off in almost opposite polarized directions is it's not only an archetypal story, but it's it's still interesting to live with and to wrestle with the history of this. So to see Red Ice made this move, so I had been I had been a guest on Red Ice. Um, when we put out the first sync book, they had me on as a guest, and my experience. I right, let me be blunt here. Let's let's just be really blunt here. The red ice mm, bump or traction is undeniable. So before I did red ice what my website numbers looked like, what my book sales looked like, you know, sort of the number of people asking me to do interviews, etc., was pretty minuscule. After I did Red Ice, it was basically like, for the alternative media community, that was like a badge of, oh, now you're legitimate. It was very apparent. I suddenly got a ton of interview requests, um, ton of book sales, to be blunt, uh, that we have never seen again. I've done a lot of interviews, you know, podcasts like this, radio shows. I've done, I've done all sorts of different media things. We, again, even the, the stuff last month with Washington Post and all that sort of stuff. We've had plenty of chances for things to to see how it goes. I I, I do manage my own website. I can see how many book sales I have, how many web hits I have after every podcast I do. And let me tell you something. I mean, I every interview I've ever done, I'd be lucky if I sold a book or two at the end of it. After Red Ice, I mean, we sold a few hundred. Um, I, I could go back and look at the numbers. It was 2011. But, I mean, it was like, wow, what is this? Um, and you got that first taste of what that felt like, and knowing in the years since, I've never seen anything even remotely close, even, even, even that I even to mention in the same sentence. It was that significant, and that's when you realize why people were so afraid to come out and say something against Red Eyes. When members of the alternative media community, when I when I started to see that was happening with Red Eyes, and I'm saying. Hey, are you guys comfortable with this? You know, you start to kind of get to know other figures within the movement, different various movements, not just sync movements, but, uh, you know, different alternative media heads, right? Or, or spokespeople, whatever, whatever terms you want to throw their way. Everyone was afraid to bite the hand that feeds them. No one wanted to rock the boat. You... If you are someone who succeeds of selling books or DVDs or being a relevant alternative media figure, you need Red Ice's traction to survive. That's that's your paycheck. When you get, oh, I get to go on Red Ice again, boom, that's that's the day you're looking forward to. That's right. how it was. Right. So 
um, you know, the, the, the temp, it was very tempting to just sort of keep your mouth shut. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not that kind of person, but I see why. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw, I mean, like my mentor at the time, um, had also been on the, on the red ice many times and got a lot of book sales out it, out of it. And he literally told me when I said, hey, this Nazi thing is really not cool. He literally told me that, well, it means book sales, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And that was the beginning of the end, because I couldn't really respect him any longer. Exactly. <laughs> Particularly if, you know, I don't know, I don't particularly align myself with this phrasing 100%, but we, we sometimes call it like, the alternative media community, but there's also the other term is right the truth movement, right? So how right. does the truth movement become so disinterested in truth? Um, it's what's scary to me, and of course, what you get, I get that same thing thrown back at me when I said, "Hey, I think your sudden your sudden interest in, you know, sucking Hitler's teat." Um, I can say that on, on yeah, you can. Right? <laughs> yeah. I tried to think of a way I could say that, uh, <laughs> uh, or you know, saying white genocide. And when I say, "Hey, that's pretty disgusting. That's pretty racist." They're like, "Oh, you're just denying the truth. You can't handle the truth. That they're they're trying to kill all the white people." I'm like, "No, no, no they're not. <laughs> it's right. not happening. You're not, imagining not it." <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Nope. Yeah. Um, it was funny because I did uh, around the time this happened. So I had been on Red Ice twice, and then we were doing this, uh, the Olympia Six Summit from 2014. Um, I had reached out to Red Ice to ask them. They had at that time, I don't know if they still do, but they had like uh, upcoming events that they would like kind of just had a small section on the right side of their, their website that was like, hey, you know, there's this conference on, I don't know, you know, the secret space program, and this conference on megaliths, or, you know, whatever, right? All the different people that they've had as guests on their shows, what different events are they doing? And I said, hey, is there any way you guys could put up a uh, Olympia Sync Summit thing just to help get the word out? And they did. They were really nice about it. And then we had, they started this conversation where, um, where I was living at the time, and where they had just moved to was not all that far apart and they were you know basically invited me hey do you want to come and spend the weekend with us and it was a completely friendly thing I mean I'm not gonna lie it was uh, you know I had a great admiration for them at the time and um, I felt really really happy about the whole thing you know oh, you're developing this relationship with these people who I admire um, obviously there's the secondary you know we're at what level is it secondary or primary sort of driving motivation of hey these people help me sell books but um, I can't I can't deny that there was probably about an equal thing of just really I was a fan of theirs uh, I'm not gonna I, I can't hide that fact I was a big fan of what they did um, so uh, I leave on this road trip before the Olympia Sing Summit, my wife and I went up for about a two-month road trip, uh, maybe two and a half months. I don't know, we were gone forever. But before we got to Olympia, we just left and just drove around and we were visiting tons of people and making our way crisscross across the country. We went up to Canada, visited Jake, and we went all over the place, right? And uh, at that point, I'm basically unplugged from the internet. I have no idea what's going on. And then I get to Denver, uh, uh, my friend Will Morgan's house. He's got a uh, one co-host of Forty Two Minutes, and I get to his house, and he's like, "Man, have you seen what's going on with Red Eyes?" And I'm like, "No, I have no idea." <laughs> and that's when people start to tell me what's going on, and as I start to investigate it and just look at their website and look at their Facebook page, and it amazes me to this day. I still have people. In the last two weeks, somebody tagged me on Facebook, they were upset that I would say anything bad about Red Eyes. And they're like, 
it's so intellectually dishonest to call them racist. And I'm like, have you seen? If you, they have, they don't hide it. They don't hide it. Okay, we're gonna take a little break. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes. Well, hey, I will. This is The Bridge with Kira. I'm Kira Young, and tonight I'm talking to Alan Abadessa Green from the Sync Book Press. You back with us? I am here, yes, indeed. So before the break, uh, we were in the middle of the conversation about this whole red ice Nazi phenomena that's been rearing its ugly head um, in the sort of in the Sync world, ov- sort of over and over there's been several waves of it so we're kind of getting to the the latest wave here of it coming up again yeah, and I guess what's scary to me is you know there's a number of factors there so I try not to I'm try I really try not to have like um like a okay it's not for me it's not a personal beef with somebody in the, in the respect of there are plenty of people I've had personal arguments with and I wouldn't take to the airwaves to say I don't like this person or you know or me and this person are fighting for me this is a purely ideological shift that they've taken that again within the context of knowing that they're a powerhouse in, in one respect I don't they have a tremendous amount of influence is what makes it scary. You know, if it was my, um, you know, some crazy guy down at the bar, you know, saying something, you can kind of go, ah, the drunk idiot or whatever. Like, this is a group of people that have tremendous Westernership uh, influence, as we said, the, the sort of stranglehold over other speakers and their followers if, if the guy you were speaking of before didn't want to rock the red ice boat because he was afraid to lose book sales well then basically you've muzzled or perhaps even converted all of that person's followers right so it's like this it's this sort of octopus um pyramidal it's it's a, it's a higher it's the very thing that they would in their olden days would be arguing against that you'd have this these hierarchies of power and uh, compartmentalization and influence and uh, you know all, all just all the elements are at play of uh, you know the Star Wars rebels becoming the Empire right you know it's like uh, we see this again and again I mean, that, that, to me that's why I sort of one of the reasons why I think it is an archetypal story. But again, in a very pragmatic sense, it worries me because if you can if you can convince people, hey, you know, Hitler wasn't that bad a guy, hey, the earth is flat, I mean all these things what what can you convince people of? I don't know it's like are we at the point where I we all thought like a Donald Trump as president was a joke and now we're sort of like not laughing anymore of oh my gosh could this actually happen um, right right and that that's the that's another kind of sinky thing is that you know what got you into this this whole thing in the first place was looking around New York and seeing the fascism that was awakening um, after 9/11 and then here you are again seeing the fascism (laughs) 
um, not only in your own sink community um, rear its ugly head, but but on the larger political scene, you know, Trump really represents another Hitler to a lot of people, and with, and with good reason. Yeah, um, I think it's it's basically it's a it's a anger is powerful and it's a useful tool. What I've wondered about red ice, and I think probably people could eat, I'm, I'm sure people are wondering about Donald Trump. I'm not even so sure these people actually, like, how do I say this? <laughs> I'm not even sure they are racist. They could just be manipulative. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, um, sure. you see how easy it is to play, We, you know, we saw after 9-11 how easy it is to play off people's fears. And you could say, oh, that kind of brown-skinned guy over there who speaks funny, he could be a terrorist, you know? You're playing off the fear of the unknown. Um, it's again, it's you're, you're othering someone. That person over there is the enemy. That person over there is strange and foreign, and and people are in a lot of ways rightfully angry. Uh, they feel disempowered, and if you are a red eyes or a Donald Trump, you're always, hey, I can use that. I just come in and I say, I'm with you guys, and we have a common enemy. And suddenly we're all buddies and pals, and you'll listen to anything I say, and you'll throw your support behind me. I mean, it's it seems pretty elementary. Um, yeah. I I think noticing how sharply red eyes turned. Uh, I mentioned this on another podcast, but I'm um, this was a while back. But uh, I don't know if you're interested, if this is interesting to you, but. I appeared on Red Eyes twice. The first time, I told you, the numbers were significant. I mean, a really, really major boost. The second time was notably less. Now, that could be my performance, for lack of a better term. It could be... You know, the topics that were expressed weren't as... You know, it could be a number of factors. It's not to say, oh, their listenership was waning. I don't know that as a fact. I'm just... So, again, this is the only sort of, I don't know, first-hand experience or evidence that I have. Is to say, I notice the distinction between the first time I was on the red ice to the second time, which was only about a year and a half, but it was noticeably less. And it was only about a year and a half after that that they took a really sharp turn towards this white supremacist viewpoint. The, the white genocide, the Hitler's, Hitler's go right with me sort of stance. Um, yeah, that is, that is interesting. It's, uh, it's kind of mysterious um, because... A lot of people base their their experience on what what is the experience of the social media their social media outlets so chat rooms Facebook pages things like that and um, my experience getting on there is is that it's filled with a bunch of racist um, hateful people that and you know if you say the wrong thing that they don't like they are just on top of you um, calling you all kinds of names and anti-white and everything. And I've mentioned this before too, but my, my experience of going on there when I, when they put out something about the, when the Redskins trademark got pulled and it was this piece about, well, look here, the, this is government sanctioned, uh, censorship and, um, you know, it's PC gone too far, that sort of thing. And I went on there and I said, you, this is really not very well researched because this isn't the result of the government coming out and saying, we're going to take your trademark away. This is a result of years of activism 
and letter writing campaign on the fa on native activists working on this for years and years and years and years so it has nothing to do with government sanctioned PC gone too far anything and immediately I was just jumped and called anti-white called a wagon burner all this stuff and it was just like I've never in my life been called a wagon burner before or after that experience and I was kind of like um, my profile picture is actually a picture of me it's not like a an equal symbol crossed out you know it's it's a picture of me right. and I'm pretty pale so uh, yeah it, it was just and it's the same rhetoric over and over it's not it's not well thought out responses it's it's the same thing like so any any time somebody goes in there and says something that's like hey this is you know this is off the mark here and this is why is going to get attacked in the same exact way. Um, and they are certainly seem to be encouraging it. They're certainly not trying to stop that at all. It's, it's the, it's the place to where Nazis go to jump on people. You know, <laughs> it's, it's weird. It's Your a weird point phenomenon. right there is interesting that the fact that they don't, so it would be one thing if you, let's say you had a forum that was, I, you know, and the sort of stated thing was, hey, I'm not going to censor anybody. If you, Kira, want to be an adamant supporter of, um, you know, the most liberal, commie, pinko agenda, I'm going to let you write it. And if skinhead number five over there wants to be the most adamant supporter of fascist, Hitler loving whatever, I'm not gonna police it. You could do you could do that, right? You could say everything's fair game. But what my friend Will points out is that and I wasn't I was joking by the way, saying you were <laughs> <laughs> But uh but you know, my, my friend's Will point of view is that you notice they do they themselves do police the and quote unquote anti white um, comments. They do censor, they do block anyone who disagrees. But you Correct. notice. They After don't. they get a beating, then they get blocked. Yeah. Correct. Right, but I'm saying it's not like there's no one on there moderating their Facebook pages or their forums. So the fact that people can throw the N word around. And not get blocked. Um, that people could say some of the most disgustingly, like, on the face, racist. There's no, there's no confusion anymore. It's not like, oh no, 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 no. I was, I was talking about Zionism. I'm not talking about Judaism. You know, it's none of this like gray area, like dancer in the subject. It's like, Jews suck, and like that's okay. Right. Um, that tells me where they're aligned. If that kind of comment is totally 100% okay, but you saying, hey, this isn't particularly well researched, there's blah, 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 is not okay, that's a really huge indication of what's what. Right. Because yeah. now it's not, it's not like uh, some random troll on the internet is the racist one. Because again, if they were, if they if they didn't censor anything, if they didn't block anyone, you could say, well, that person doesn't speak for red ice. Just as you don't speak for red ice, you're just someone commenting on their page. But if you get blocked and that person doesn't, I think it's really clear. Um, and yeah. plus, I mean, like, Lana's got a Twitter account that I didn't realize. Um, I don't really run the Twitter for SyncBook, Doug does, and I guess we're still like following. So I get these emails, I get, it's like, it's like every few days I get this reminder of how bad it is. I get an email saying, popular in your Twitter network, right? And it's almost always, it's like, Henrik tweeted, or Red Ice tweeted, or Lana tweeted, and I'm like, wait, this is popular in my network? Who are these people following me if they like what these people are writing? Why are we connected on, you know? But if yep. you know, Twitter's telling me this is popular amongst my common group of people on Twitter, 
which scares me. It scares me. Why is this popular? Why, you know, they had a picture, their, their most recent thing on Red Eyes was about, um, like, uh, the solstice and Norwegian sort of um, slant on Scandinavian celebration, you know, Yule and, you know, the, the, the true roots of the, the holiday. Take a look at it. Do you notice that they have a little Celtic cross there that's on fire? And you're telling me the idea of a burning cross on this image was totally like, oh, that wasn't what I was going for. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just it's just a happenstance, you know, just, right. oh, I thought it looked cool, you know. Right. Right. I just thought some fire would make it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, I mean, they really are responsible for making this term white genocide like an actual hashtag that people use. I never saw it before them. And I was like, is this a joke? Is this satire? Like, like I seriously I... thought it was satire in, at first. And be no, people are serious. And especially with the Star Wars thing. I mean, that when um, Freeman Flies thing came out with the Star Wars and white genocide and all this, I was like, this, if you didn't know, you would, you would literally think this is satire because it's, it's so like ridiculous. Like onion. Yeah. Yeah. It's the idea a that a Hollywood movie comes out and a black guy gets one of the pretty good roles in it. And I don't know if you've seen Star Wars. Not yet. Don't He's ruin not, it. <laughs> I'm not. Well, I'm not going to ruin it. It's, I, it's funny. I actually, whatever. I actually didn't care about it, but I'm not going to ruin it for anybody. All I'm going to say is, I did end up seeing it. My wife's younger sisters wanted to go see it, um, and I went with them. All I'm going to say is, he's not the main character, right? Even and even if he was, that would be totally cool. But my my point is, people are freaking out because a black guy got an okay job in Hollywood. Yeah, if There's that's... Still, everyone else in that movie is white as snow, let me tell you something. That is a white movie. And then there's, like, the black guy. And... Yeah, it, and that's genocide? Like, how? Who's getting like, genocided there? Like, it because I, the black person gets a job in Hollywood, they're trying to kill white people? I'm not putting it together. Presses. Yeah. One, one got through. <laughs> it's, it's, it really seems like a, that should be an Onion article, right? Yeah. Or, you know, some, some sort of satire thing. I, and I'm... The fact that it's not, the fact that, and the fact that people take this seriously. And you mentioned Freeman. I mean, uh, you know, I was another guy. I mean, I considered myself fairly friendly with for a number of years, and I, I am so... I, uh, I'm so sort of uncomfortable with this fact that he seems to... Again, I, it makes me... It really makes me wonder if it's not just like following the money, following the controversy, you know. Um, Kira, I'm going to be, you know, as I said, this is, if we're talking about my experience in the history of things, is to say the same way I ran away from so after Red Ice, I started getting a lot of emails, and I had this sort of... You could see there was the possibility to be one of these guru figures on the on the platform, right? Of, oh, you could be this guy who tells you about synchronicity and who... You know, whatever. Just this sort of voice of authority. And I really didn't want that. But I saw, oh, that's how this works. And trust me, for my, for my wallet... There are days that I regret it. <laughs> sure. <know>? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm working 16-hour days, a, a day job, to come home and put in a few hours of work on this thing. Going, why don't? Why am I working so hard? This, this is, you know, there's got to be an easier way. And you realize, for these guys, oh, I could sell more DVDs if I if I paint this as some sort of controversy. You know, whereas for, for the, the work that I'm doing, this is about as controversial as it gets, is this conversation we're having right here. For the most part, um, you know, we are, again, exploring stuff. We're not coming out with any sort of viewpoint or, or 
beating any drums to say this is you got to be cool with this you got to be against this you know or any anything like that but for me i feel like i have to be saying something about this because of my affiliations with these people because of the fact that like if it's almost like watching this thing that i loved getting co-opted and transformed into this perverse version of it instead of looking for the truth we've gone down to like the most knee jerk reactionary inane reptilian brained responses of ooh hit the brown person you know or it's the jews it's what a, you know like, where where did all of that intellectual pursuit go where did um, I mean, aside from the fact that it's morally or ethic, it's it's ethically wrong in in my mind to be to hold that position. And I, I I guess the reason I'm struggling around those words is I try never to be overly moralistic. Um, a lot of you know we start off this call as so like I try and exist in this mental space of of question marks and paradoxes. Um, but I can't, I can't see this any other way, um, than just, first of an out and out lie, the, the idea that the white race is, is under attack. Where are they going? By whom? They're here. They're all over. As I said, this was, this happened while I was doing this road trip, zigzagging, across the country for two months and let me tell you something there are a lot of white people in this country there are a lot lot a lot of white people they ain't going anywhere anytime yeah. soon yep if yeah. you wanted to say you know the nation is um you know sw like let's 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 find a cause that we could actually all agree on hey you know where did the um the middle class go. Why is the entire country slipping into um, debt slavery? Why is you know this is a this crosses every racial boundary, every religion, every everything. There are things that we could actually unite and say, hey, we have some serious issues at play here. The, the right. rise of a, of a police state. The, I mean, that is undoubtedly, again, with Red Ice and that whole alternative media crowd should be. If you were saying how bad the police state is, why aren't you upset that the police are just murdering black guys in the middle of the street for no crime? That should be one of your flagship uh, concerns. This is a, this is a blatant um, display of the police state. That should be one of your things to be outraged over. Yep. If yeah. you were really, you know. These are things we could actually be uniting on and saying, hey, wait a second, the alternative media that was so upset with the rise of fascism in a police state and suddenly we have like a Black Lives Matter movement that is concerned with the, the killings of young men in the, in the, and women in the street for no crimes just because of the color of their skin or prejudice or, or lousy policing or institutionalized race, whatever, this could be the moment of unity and bridging activist groups rather than a weird polarizing it's 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 mind-boggling well and that's one of the things that makes me think it's all pretty engineered you know um that here was some intellectually open and explorative people started this really polished well listened to radio um, podcast um, and what happened was it and that's the big question I think was this the plan from the beginning or did it happen a, you know was there like some sort of Yoko Ono moment or you know people are asking like how could this be um, so <laughs> and we may not know the answer but I think it speaks certainly to um, the character of a lot of people in the community that said no no mm -mm, I'm not going there no uh -uh. this is uh -uh, unacceptable <laughs> this is BS and I'm calling it 
because that yeah. was more overwhelming than people than people going oh yeah I, I'm just gonna turn make this Nazi turn with you the 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 no way in in hell was very apparent from the beginning of the turn yeah and um, it seems you know they were okay with that I mean they 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 blocked a ton of people on Facebook and just went their way and got their new audience or whatever it might be and and certainly brought enough of the old audience with them to say I've always trusted Red Eyes to bring me you know the, and like it's, the thing is they've presented it as such uh, that well you know these this was the uncomfortable information it goes back to that you know um, what I was saying in the beginning where you you're presented with some new information that hey you might not be ready for this you know and their whole thing is like well you know people didn't want to think about uh, the possibility of extraterrestrials or people didn't want to think about the possibility of uh, you know shadow governments or etc etc well people didn't want to you know people just are not ready to for the truth that actually actually Hitler's great Jews suck, and um, black people, even though it looks like they got a pretty raw deal, they got it great, and they're trying to kill us all. Right. Let, let's totally disconnect from reality and, and sell it as truth. And that's... So, it, do you think it's a cult? Well, it certainly oper operates as one. It, it, it has the advantage of operating as one, for sure. Uh, the fact that you can't can't question it, and that uh, as I said, I, I was sort of saying they the, the power that they have, and I, and I to a certain extent um, speak from experience of having said like I really respected them. I mean, I don't know if you remember I did a um, oh I don't remember when this was, but uh, so it's shortly after returning from Olympia, so it was probably like September. 2014, something like that, I did this, um, Andros and I did a, a, a synchronized sort of finale, uh, and in there I did an open letter to Red Ice. Which was fantastic, yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you, but I yeah. mean, that was, um, I never heard anything back from it, they just blocked me on Facebook, and that was the end of that. No, no response, but I, I assume they heard it, because I was suddenly blocked on their Facebook accounts. Um, well, it was actually, you know, that podcast that attracted me to you and on Andras. I mean, that's really, you know, a pivotal moment where I said, okay, here's some people with integrity who, and because I knew that people were choosing to remain silent so that the, the book sales continued for them. So I was like, okay these people are speaking their conscience and I recognized it as such and I recognized it as that it would be detrimental um, in terms of your income as well well I guess in one respect the blessing here is that the income was never that much <laughs> <laughs> easy come easy go <laughs> right I mean I said, except for you know, so um, we put out the first sync book. We did Red Eyes. Let me tell you something. Like I said, we, I told you, we sold a ton of books after that first Red Eyes. And then I just watched the book sales slowly drift off. And, you know, I've been, we've been basically making chump change ever since. Um, in one respect, that probably made it easier. Um, but, again, like, I could see, as I said, like, the the sort of, it's almost like a pyramid scheme. You asked, is it like a cult? So, Again, I did Red Ice. I had the opportunity to suddenly then take this position of authority. Um, as I said, the, 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 the requests for interviews were incredible. Um, and the way in which, was, you know, I would get invited onto a podcast and they'd say, here comes Alan, an expert on blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, am I an expert on this? Like, am I? I don't know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think I would call myself that, you know, and it just, the whole thing made me uncomfortable where I was like, I feel like I'm still figuring this out. I don't want to be an expert. I want to be, if anything, you know, 
uh, one of the things I wanted to do with the sync book was to say, look at all what all these other people have done. Maybe combined, maybe if you take 50 people and put them together, maybe we have enough expertise. But I don't. I, there's no one person in particular that I would say has all the answers. You know. Uh, so it made so like I was trying to wrestle with this idea of well I need to be a spokesperson for these people and I want to I do want to sell the book not just for for the money but to get the whole point of doing it was to make it accessible and get the word out and all these sorts of things but I quickly realized I don't want to be the guru I don't mind I didn't mind really being the spokesperson saying hey check out the work of Will Morgan check out the work of Andros Jones check out the work of Jake Katza you know check out Goro Adachi I don't mind being that guy. But I didn't want to be the guru that has the answers. I had, you know, people emailing me saying, you know, tell me the secret of blah blah blah. You know, like I I don't have that secret. I don't I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, right. like, I, I, you're just saying that. Like, no, I'm just a guy who's who's looking at some really interesting information. I might have a perspective or some information that you don't have, but undoubtedly you have some that I don't have. Like, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's figure out where we overlap, where we agree, where we disagree. What can you share with me? What can I share with you? And let's make something of that. Let's take this experience together. Um, again, it's not a way to sell books. It's not a way to sell much. Um, I've realized that. I'm a terrible businessman. <laughs> this, is, this is a terrible business model. Um, you know, we were... Uh, you know, we, we would regularly have, if somebody became interested in our show, we might have them on our podcast, you know, as a guest, just to be like, hey, so what did, what have you seen so far? What are you jiving on? What are you, whatever, you know? It's like, um, then when we started like a, like a membership section, it's the question of, uh, well, do we have, like, who are we selling this to? Because if, if everyone who's sort of in the community is kind of like in it, how do you sell them themselves? It's like, oh, I guess we're not really, you know, I don't, you know, there's all these questions came up of what, what, what is the business model? And ultimately that has always remained a secondary or tertiary concern. The concern has been to be intellectually and morally honest to be to truthfully explore this stuff and to build a community of people to help us you know maybe even help us keep us in check um, I like the idea of a red eyes blocking people who disagrees with them seems I get the temptation of like oh here's this person who's annoying me every day to you know challenge me on whatever but I almost, in a way, welcome that of like, well, you know, maybe they're noticing a blind spot that I'm not, or whatever it is. Um, all these sorts of questions that have come up, the the business side of it has, again, it was just so almost so, so minimal from the beginning, and I'm not being coy when I say it was really very little money that was coming in anyway so it was a pretty easy decision to make um, so the, the it's twofold you know the not only is it tempting to shut your mouth and just oh okay so so they're exploring this Nazi thing no big deal but the other tempt is to become this guru so that you can capitalize on the moment so we see that a lot in alternative media where um, people just capitalize on on that moment so that they can get whatever they can out of their 15 minutes or, or, or whatever so this is what happens when you say no to both of those <laughs> you're not going to be rewarded um, for yeah, I'm not necessarily recommending this path. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying it's what I've done. I don't know if it's really, uh, if I've got the ideal life over here or anything. I'm just saying, yeah. This, this is what happens when you reject both of those. 
yeah, and but that's <laughs> archetypal in and of itself, isn't it? That right there. I mean, it's 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 the crossroads all over again, right? You either sell your soul to the devil, um, metaphorically speaking, uh, and you get all the fame and the riches and the wealth, and um, or you uh, stick to the the straight and narrow, so to speak. Well, can I ask you a, a blunt question? Sure. Do you think there is fame and riches to be had in an alternative media? I mean, except maybe like an Alex Jones or somebody has like turned into like a real serious business. Um, and I've, while it's somewhat hearsay, I've I've heard that Red Ice was doing incredibly well for themselves. But there's also the product, as far as I I think, there's the product of them being sort of on the scene at the right time, right place, with a good business model in place. Like, Red Ice, uh, to be completely objective, I think Red Ice had an excellent business model. Hey, we give you a podcast, it's two hours, first hour is free, second hour isn't, you know, you can, you can pay for that or not. I, and I honestly think that's a great business model for a podcast. Um, they yeah. had that all in place, and they were sort of around at the start of as the internet sort of blossomed and the alternative media blossomed on the internet. I, 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 I wonder how much of that is, at least in the start, was a sort of luck of uh, luck partnered with like a really good head on their shoulders. And I mean that completely objectively. Like I, I take nothing away from them there. They were prudent to have a really good foundation in place and they obviously worked very hard so I don't think it's all just luck but to say do you think in the last few years is there anybody who sort of takes the scene and suddenly could have like a ton of money where is the money coming from are you selling books are you selling memberships on a website are you selling hits on YouTube you know like what do you how do you how, I don't all of the I, above I, I think to actually work the alternative media, you have to do it all. Um, so you have to have money coming in on your YouTube channel. You have to uh, be selling books. You have you have to work it all, um, and memberships to your, to your site. So ultimately, um, there, there, like you said, there's there's two parts to it. There's you know what you're doing as a business person. Um, which can bring in a steady, I'm not going to say a huge, you know, like you're going to be um, living in a mansion or anything like that. But I think you can actually earn a steady living at it. But you, For you, sure, yeah. yeah. I, and I, sorry, that's all I guess I just wanted to clarify. Is to say, like, I don't think there is, I honestly don't know if there is riches or fame to be made. There's probably just a steady income. And what's scary and I'm sorry I, I cut you off here, but just um, what's scary to me is what it would take to just meet that level of steady. And that, I think, is one of the... It's one of the systematic problems with our time and place right now. Because say, um, I don't know, pick a... Imagine any alternative media figure in your head, okay? Guy, girl any left or right whatever whatever right just pick just picture somebody in your mind and they start to do a podcast it starts to get successful and by successful it means you're getting listeners and at first you're measuring everything is going oh man I got a few hundred people listening to me oh, I got a few thousand people listening to me oh I whatever but maybe you're only making a few bucks and then you go well how do I monetize that I've got the audience how do you monetize such a thing or or even scarier, it's the question of, wow, it's taking me, this is something I've encountered over and over, I've had to put in 60 hours of work this week on maintaining a website that's completely free of podcasts and videos that people are consuming for free and going, thanks, that was great, and going on with their lives. And it's like, I could, I could be working a second or third job and be doing fairly well, but this is my passion. This is what I want to do. 
how can I do this instead of going to this day job that I hate? So you start to make, you start to have to think like a business person. You start to say, what do, what do I need to do here? I think this is like very human. This is unavoidable in this field. And you say, okay, well maybe I need to, you know, charge for this here. Maybe I need to have a member section. Maybe I need to. Whatever I've I've had people come to me and say I want to put a book out. For, I, I have a we have Sync Book Press. People say I want to put a book out because if I put a book out, that's a sign of legitimacy. They say, oh, I noticed that people only get um, lecturing gigs at alternative you know circuits and presentations and conferences if they've got a book out or it's a book I can sell at the conference or whatever. So I kind of like you see how people's minds start to think differently, and I I sometimes wonder. If it's us, and by us I mean me and you, who are quasi like figures on that stage, as well as us, the audience, as you and I both are probably enjoy other people's work. I enjoy yours. You might enjoy mine, and probably a few, you know, countless others, right? But the people listening to this show right now, I don't mean this as a guilt trip. I mean this as like a real statement of what I think is the problem. We've gotten so used to. Downloading music, we're not paying for digital content. I can, if I want to hear a song, I can pull up YouTube, I can listen to it, I can download it, I can whatever. I, it's so easy to pirate it or get it for free. If I want to listen to a podcast, I might listen to a podcast on a regular basis and just like, hey, that's great, and not give them a dime. At what point do you have to hear somebody say, you know? Uh, I, I told bad people tell me about Vinnie Eastwood. They couldn't listen to Vinnie Eastwood's show because he asked for donations so much. Why does that guy have to listen to ask for donations so damn much? Right? Why, right. Why, 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 should he, why should he have to? Why are we supporting the things we enjoy and the people whose work we respect? And there's almost this scary thing that that tells me we are part of the problem by not supporting the the people when they're honest. And that they're resonating with us, we almost force their hand into becoming a little bit slipping out of that honesty and slipping a little more into the business-minded, calculated decisions. Well, I would, I would love to put this podcast out. I'd love to put this video out for free, but you know, it's not really worth my time to put all this effort into it. Maybe I'll just do it if it's a paid thing, or maybe I won't do it at all because I got to go to work tomorrow, or whatever it is. We're we're shooting ourselves in the foot by not supporting the very. And when I say community here, I don't mean like the sync community. I mean the the wider community of alternative media. We say how bad mainstream media is, but we're not supporting any alternative, at least not financially. People don't, you know, people have subscriptions to Netflix. Uh, or whatever, but are they throwing money behind their their, their the alternative to Netflix? Um, and that yeah. to me is what is an unspoken issue here: is that I see the temptation to do something, of, just even sell your soul a little bit, just a little bit every day, is almost a necessary cost of doing business. And I don't think it's for the big sellout; it's for Making rent. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. It, well, a bunch of things occurred occurred to me because this is obviously something that I think about, and and you know, I have a day job. I have to work a forty hour week at a day job to support myself. This is not how I make my living. This is how I keep from going insane because I need an intellectual stimulation that I'm not getting from the way that I make my living. So there's that. Um, but what occurs, I mean, from, you don't really understand the, pro how deep the problem is until you're on the side that we're on as producers, where we're expected to produce content for free. And then we're, you know, brutalized if we ask for a donation as though that's, you know, we've committed some sin, but yet we owe free content to these people that complain. Um, and and you get brutalized so much that you're almost, you just like don't even want to ask for anything anymore because you you get so beat down for it and it's really odd the things that people do support and the things that people don't 
So I, I had this recent experience where me and my husband started this uh, Yellow Thunder Food Sovereignty project where, you know, I got this great vision of, you know, uh, we need to control our own food supply. You can never really have true sovereignty unless you have sovereignty over your food supply. And, you know, I could, we, I come from a farming family and my husband comes from a farming tribe and so we're like let's try to grow food and and try to create our own food sovereignty and in the process we could help feed our hungry neighbors and we're all broke that's the thing is we're all broke I think that's part of the problem too so I got a little bit of support I got like eight hundred dollars in donations that's pretty good I was excited but it took so much more and like I had to borrow three thousand dollars just for fencing and I got a couple of other donations in for like you know um, projects like our hoop house I got 500 for that and um, we had a broken down tiller that that a donation paid to get fixed things like that but it wasn't like I suddenly got thousands of dollars and I was just like rolling in the money and every single penny got invested into this project um, so here people are uh, suddenly people just like took this turn where they were like I don't want to support that but yet these they, I like how it sounds and everything but how dare you ask me to support it <laughs> um, and then those same people go and support somebody who's basically getting donations to go on on a vacation and film it you know like those same people who were like horrified by me asking for them to support my radio show or my food sovereignty project we're, we're like oh yeah we'll give a hundred dollars for you to go you know um, on a drinking binge with your buddy and call it a magical mystery school you know it's just it's I don't understand it I really don't but I know we're all broke <laughs> well precisely I think um so there's a few things you said there. One is the idea that we're all broke, and I think that is, that's a, obviously a widespread thing. It was one of the things that I was saying we should have a unified front on, is the fact that economically we're all struggling. That being said, most people I know, um, out, you know, have, a, have, like I said, have a Netflix or a Hulu account or a, you know, or they buy an expensive cup of coffee or something. You know, I think like they fi they find five ten bucks when they when they want it, right? So like, it's just a question of prioritizing or valuing this thing. Is if if I have five ten bucks, is it worth it for me to give it to you? You know, it's what you're doing valuable to me. Um, so it's it's one respect. It's just that that shift of mindset of. I could give this five ten dollars to Starbucks or to Netflix, or I could give it to, you know, Revolution Radio or whatever. Uh, so these these are questions there. Um, but the other point you made is that having that day job, in one respect, I know for me, that's one of the things that's kept me honest. Is that if I didn't have a day job, I might be a lot more desperate to make some of these uncomfortable decisions, right? You know, oh, do I have to start pandering to this audience or whatever? Like, I don't have to pander to anybody. I go to work, you know? So, like, my bills are paid. It's really hard, but then I can come home and whatever energy or time I have left, I give to you guys and I'll make a podcast and I'll, you know, I'll make a video. You know, um, obviously it hurts my production and it hurts my energy level, but it's it keeps me honest. Uh, so these are all, I think, excellent sort of points. Um, I guess what I'm saying is even though the day job keeps me honest, I think the overall atmosphere is such that both for myself and speaking to other people, it seems, it sure seems the only way to ever make that transition would be a little bit of selling out which which it shouldn't be it shouldn't be you know and certainly doing like an indiegogo for a, a farm is not selling out but you know what i'm saying is like on that bigger picture of why would someone suddenly say oh i'm totally on board with this white genocide bs or um you know uh, i've talked about 
uh, someone I, I know within the alternative media campaign community who was like really into UFO stuff and then suddenly said, you know, I could, I realized that when I talk about UFOs and aliens, I could just say that they're the same thing as demons and get the whole Christian audience. And that was a, like, whatever their quote unquote exploration for truth was, they just decided to change, you know, they're that, at that point, you stopped at looking for truth. You, I mean, I'm not, I'm not big into UFOs or anything, but that was something. That, I'll just start saying that it's demons, that an, a UFO and a demon are the same thing, and I can get the Christian audience, which is a huge audience. It's that whole red, um, Alex Jones, you know, GCN audience. Let me, let me start pandering to that and get some of that money. Why did that guy have to make that? You know, I'm not, I'm not saying he shouldn't be held responsible for his decision, but I think there is a systematic problem in place that he probably didn't see many other good options. Oh, I would definitely agree with that. Um, so, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to get a sponsor for the show, um, and I only really picked this sponsor, which is AwesomeX.com, because... I've had such an awesome experience with their product. So I use it. I believe in it. So it's not like I'm telling people to get something that is harmful to them or that I don't actually really truly believe in. So um, each decision is, is something that you, you wrestle with um, for sure. And I, don't, I definitely don't have the answers, but I, I figure out um, workarounds, I guess, uh, along the way. Um, yeah, I definitely don't have any answers there. Um, and I don't have the time to put into let's, or the money really to build a site that would be like a membership site. Um, and this show it, itself, I mean, Revolution Radio is kind enough to have me on. They need help too. They struggle and um, I have friends that, you know, my friend Steven helps me make a video afterward. Uh, my friend Anne helps me book guests. So people, there's a community where people see the content that they enjoy and they support it in other ways because we're all broke. So, um, you know, Steven's broke, but he can make videos and I live in the woods and I can't make videos. I don't have the, the bandwidth. And uh, Anne knows more people than I know. So um, there's other ways to support besides money, too, I guess is my, my point. It's an excellent point, yeah. Uh, I've, I've been in, in immensely helped. Out. You mentioned, like, as far as building a membership site. So I, uh, the Singpo.com, we do have tons of free content. And it's like, I would say the majority of it is free content. But we did... We do have uh, members' content. We do have members' archives and stuff like that. And that was basically a gift to me is somebody, uh, his name is Guillaume Samard, an amazing man who is an amazing uh, computer programmer who stepped in to offer his assistance. And I've, well, some of the money that we've come in, I've, I've tried to you know help compensate his time, but he put in way more time than I could ever really honestly afford to to give what his time is worth um, so that was a gift and there's yeah exactly things where people can the workload of making a video of, of all the different pieces that go into place I do a, I do a podcast called always record which is basically like people get together turn on the recorder and you just let it run and you just gab for a few hours right nothing no, no fancy production People don't realize that takes me like six hours if, you know, to, to put that whole show together. And there's like almost zero production, but there's all the little pieces. Getting it set up for the RSS feed, doing the artwork, doing you know, all uh, the MP3 tagging, uploading it to this server, putting it out on Facebook. It's just, I'm always surprised when I'm like, oh, I'll just pick this episode out real quick before I, nope, hours later, it's finally done, you know. So, all the it's the time suck as well. So I, I'm with you. Um, I've been very blessed to have help from others that wasn't necessarily financial. That was um, helping hands is a huge, 
huge contribution. If anyone's interested out there, um, just know if you have, ever have any doubt if someone could use a hand, I'm sure, what if it's Kira Revolution Radio or another host in Revolution Radio, myself or anybody that you enjoy their work and you have a question, maybe I could help them out, I can't really afford, I'm sure they would appreciate it. So. Yeah, even just sharing the, the, the content that we put out. Um, that's a big thing, you know, just share it. That's in and of itself. Wow, this has flown by. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alan, for joining me tonight. We will have to talk soon again.